Unit 3, Lesson 2, Prohibition and Women, the Legislative Changes. Students will be able to identify the extremes of 1920s religions, political ideologies, social life, and economic institutions, and the legislative changes that impacted society. Our essential question, why were the 1920s filled with political, social, and economic extremes? What legislative changes altered the course of American history? Unit 3, Lesson 2, Vocabulary. During this lesson, we'll examine the traditional values, including prohibition, the Scopes trial, the Red Scare, nativism, and the rise of the KKK, beginning with fundamentalism, which wanted to be a return to Puritan values and a direct challenge to American immorality. Traditionalism being a return of Puritan Christian values originating in the 1600s with the Puritans who came over across the Atlantic and settled in North America. They began to question America's rising immorality. Those who began to question it were led by Christian evangelical radio sermons throughout the country, as shown in the picture on the bottom left. One of the most popular evangelical preachers of his time was Billy Sunday. Traditionalism and the Puritan views helped usher in the temperance movement, a social movement of the 19th and early 20th centuries, where people in social, political, and religious groups believed that the United States would be a better nation if drinking alcohol was restricted. The movement was just meant to encourage people to drink less at first, but then people decided that alcohol should not be sold at all. They believed alcohol badly impacted society and individuals' morals. That alcohol was the main reason for unemployment problems at work, homelessness, and for the increases in violence and crime. The 18th Amendment to the Constitution of the United States all but outlawed consumption of liquor in the United States of America. The Volstead Act, passed in 1919, allowed the United States government to enforce the 18th Amendment, citing that any drink containing 0.5% alcohol or higher was illegal, and that it was illegal to barter, deliver, or possess alcohol. And thus began the culture wars of the 1920s. Prohibition. The 18th Amendment and the Volstead Act, supported by middle-class progressives and rural Protestants, especially in the South and in the West, though it was generally ignored in urban centers. The Prohibition era gave the birth to bootleggers and rum runners who smuggled alcohol to establishments called speakeasies or underground saloons. This led to a rise in organized crime. Most notorious of the gangsters of the time, Al Capone, is said to have made over $100 million during the Prohibition era. Public responses to the 18th Amendment were mainly to want the repeal of the 18th Amendment. People sold liquor on the black market. As mentioned before, Al Capone, a notorious gangster out of Chicago, made over $100 million selling alcohol illegally. Many people did not enforce the law since many were against it, especially in big cities and the big urban areas, made popular through the Industrial Revolution. And so, since most people were against the 18th Amendment, and individuals in large urban cities and city centers continued to consume alcohol. The 18th Amendment and Prohibition were repealed by passage of the 21st Amendment. Individual states still had the power to outlaw consumption, and many states remained dry states for decades, but there was no longer a national ban on the consumption or sale and transportation of alcohol. Culture wars of the 1920s also had a religious viewpoint. 
where fundamentalism, or the literal view of the Bible and creationism, attacked urban lifestyle and culture. And revivalists like Billy Sunday and Amy Semple McPherson, followers and followings grew larger by the year. Modernism, which was a liberal view of religion and preached acceptance and coordination of science within the context and with their faith. Both of these views, modernism and fundamentalism, came together in the Scopes Monkey Trial of 1925, which pitted a law in Tennessee against teaching evolution at a public school. And a school teacher who taught evolution and Charles Darwin's theories of evolution to his students in his science class. On Scope's side, he had famous lawyer and author Clarence Darrow. And on the school district's side, the side of creationism, the side of fundamentalism, they had Williams Jenning Bryan. Throughout the Scopes trial and the trial of the teachings of Charles Darwin's theory of evolution, the trial made a mockery of the fundamentalist views, especially when Clarence Darrow cross-examined school board employees on their fundamentalist creationist views. And the post-war consumerism era, helped by the capitalistic nature and consumerist nature of the American public, we began to see changes in our American consumer society. The American consumer society would most aptly be defined as a welfare capitalistic society in the 1920s, where the theory was there's real income increases and higher pay rates for owners, managers, and skilled laborers, but very minimal increases in the pay rates for unskilled laborers and the working class. There were insurance benefits offered and profit sharing incentives, as well as an increase in worker safety, but simultaneously there was a decrease in the influence of labor unions and a de decrease in the registration of workers in labor unions. This ran concurrently with the mass production of a wide variety of products. And this wide variety of products were available at affordable prices for the consumer. With the invention of the assembly line by the Ford Motor Company, while they mass produced their Model T automobile and other domestic appliances of the Industrial Revolution era, there began a slogan of no money, no problem. Installment plans became a fact of life. And the impact of the automobile on consumer shopping and consumer habits was tremendous. Now, individual citizens could go to other places to shop, could go to other cities and other towns with much more ease than a horse-drawn carriage or by horseback. And thus began the beginning of the American car culture, which led to secondary industries and urban sprawl, highway construction amidst the oil boom to have a safe way for all of the cars of America to travel. Housing expanded into suburban communities along these highways, and the car culture granted women greater freedom but there was a danger. The death toll rose, which encouraged installment buying and hurt the railroad industry. As more people were traveling by private automobile or accompanying others with private automobiles than were traveling on the railroads. The Red Scare of the 1920s. Americans, and especially the American government, had memories of the Bolshevik Revolution, which bred fear throughout our country. Anti-red laws popped up in cities and states nationwide. 
to make sure that there was no advocation for violent social change. Many in the government treated unions as communism in disguise. And United States Attorney General Mitchell Palmer was known for the Palmer Raids for un-American activity, suspected communist activity. In the Sacco and Vanzetti trial of 1921, we'll remember from our Unit 3 Lesson 1 vocabulary, began a reemergence of nativism where Italian immigrants, despite very little evidence of their guilt, were put to death on, after their trial. Nativism in the 1920s began with a new wave of immigration and a new wave of immigrants coming to the United States. Americans, by and large, believed Europe was vomiting its wretched refuse. And some of the policy changes that came into play, the Emergency Quota Act of 1921, which limited immigration to only 3% of the United States population, and the Immigration Act of 1924 further limited the influx of immigrants to 2% of the population. The Immigration Act of 1929 put a strict cap in the total number of immigrants that would be allowed at just over 150,000. And throughout each of these acts, the American dream was sacrificed and the U.S. population was segregated to immigrants and non-immigrants or nativists. Thus, nativist activity gave birth or rise to the KKK. This Protestant Christianity terror group with a platform of anti-foreigners, anti-Catholics, anti-Blacks, anti-Jews, anti-pacifists, anti-communists, anti-internationalists, anti-evolutionists, anti-bootleggers, anti-gambling, anti-adulterers, and anti-birth control specifically wanted anybody who was non-white, non-male, non-Christian views to not be allowed in America. And those who were already in America, the KKK terrorized and made their life a living hell. There were major progressive changes of the era of the 1920s. Changes to the 1920s women. The flapper girl, a young woman of the jazz age, characterized by short hair, short hemlines, cosmetics, and cigarettes. This was against the traditionalist view of women. Women began being employed as clerical workers, as teachers, as nurses, or domestic servants. They were often paid lower wages than men, and not many served in management positions, but it was amongst the first times in history that women were working outside of the home. Famous or prominent women like Margaret Sanger, who established the American, American Birth Control League and Planned Parenthood, which provided resources to women nationwide and is still in existence today. Women were interested in more than short hair and jazzy parties, weren't they? The suffrage movement and the 19th Amendment. Suffrage is the right to vote in political elections. During the suffrage movement, women sought the right to vote. Suffragette is women seeking the right to vote through organized protest. Protests were organized nationally as women sought institutional changes in the American political system. Suffragists wore white, symbolizing purity. White was associated with youth, virginity, and moral virtue. White suggested that women could be expected to vote for politicians and policies that would better society and not just themselves. Suffragists marching for women's rights to vote during the 1920s. Suffragists versus suffragettes. What's the difference between a suffragist and a suffragette? While these terms are often used interchangeably, they are actually not the same. While both fought for women's rights to vote, 
suffragettes adopted a more militant approach. Examples of American suffragists include Additional examples of American suffragists include a few more prominent examples of American suffragists. The changing landscape of voting before and after the passage of the 19th Amendment. We're now in 2018, women make up 53% of the electorate, same as they did for the previous five midterms, where 53% of voters were women and only 47% of voters were men. 100 years after the passage of the 19th Amendment, the modern day suffragists fighting for expanded roles for women and expanded access in Congress. Women now not only have the right to vote in America, but women serve in both houses of Congress of the United States government. Enacting sweeping legislation aimed at helping more women be enfranchised, helping more women become members of Congress, helping more women represent women throughout our country.